All right, guys. Well, here we are for our Sunday evening uh, meeting time together. Um, I wanted to just send a brief video so that we can continue to be strengthened in the Word of God. And I pray that this time together will do such. Um, the main reason that I'm posting this on YouTube is for accessibility. It's not a live stream. It's a pre-recorded video. And um, mainly this is for the Pleasant Hill Bible Church uh, members. If you're seeing this video, thank you for tuning in. I, I pray that you're blessed by what we're going to talk about tonight. But um, I can't encourage you enough to, to be plugged into a, a local body of believers wherever you may be. Um, you know, you need to get to a Bible preaching, gospel believing church so that you can manifest, so that you can uh, bless those individuals there through the gifts that God has given you and, and ultimately further the kingdom of God with the way that, uh, that he sees fit to use you. So uh, thank you for watching if you're watching this, but I can't encourage you enough to get plugged in to a, to a local body of believers. Uh, the reason that I'm posting this video on, online is because of the, the coronavirus, the word that we've grown so accustomed to hearing. Um, and I find it very interesting, though, that God is teaching us that church membership is important. Uh, church membership is, is, is biblical, and church membership is commanded by believers. So um, the, you say, well, what do you mean and why? Well, look where everyone is looking at this time. Everyone's looking to the government to help them. Christians don't do that. We don't put our faith in governments. We trust God. But as a local body of believers is assembling together, uh, it's biblical to support one another, to strengthen one another, to meet the needs of each other. And the really the only uh, smooth way of doing that is to have a, a active church membership. Um, so the coronavirus is actually teaching us a lot of things and, and, and restructuring our perspective of, of where we were. Uh, God has shattered idols away. So, um, but that aside, I want to strengthen uh, each other in the Word of God. That's my main motive with these videos. So, tonight we're going to be in Psalm 119. I'm going to read some scripture with you tonight. And, and I just want you to follow along as I read. I want you to be nourished by the truth of God's Word. And I want to talk about something tonight called hermeneutics. And you say, well, why are you always pulling out these big words? <laughs> Uh, I'm not trying to, you know, enamor you. Uh, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, make you think that I'm smarter than I actually am. <laughs> but, but one thing's for certain is, is hermeneutics is a very important thing to the Christian. We're going to talk about that tonight. This is going to be a brief video, but I want to structure the way you interpret the scriptures. And uh, we're going to be doing so by looking at Psalm 119, Psalm 119 and also Isaiah chapter 40. So if you take your Bibles tonight, I want you to turn to Psalm 119 and look at verse 113. When you get there, I'm going to give you some time to get there. Psalm 119, verse 113. We're going to read the whole way to uh, verse 136. So Psalm 113 to verse 136. And then after that, we're going to go look at Isaiah chapter 40. So... Um, if you get there with me in your Bible, Psalm 119. By the way, this, the 119th Psalm is the largest, longest chapter in the Bible. Just an interesting note there. Um, Psalm 113 says, I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. Depart from me, ye evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to, unto thy word, that I may live, and let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto, unto thy statutes continually. Thou hast trodden down all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross, therefore I love thy testimonies. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. I have done judgment and justice. Leave me not to mine oppressors. Be, be surety for thy servants for good. Let not the proud oppress me. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation, and 
for the word of thy righteousness. Deal with thy servant according unto thy mercy, and teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. I opened my mouth and panted, for I longed for thy commandments. Look thou upon me, and be merciful unto me, as thou hast unset, uh, thou unset to do unto those that love thy name. Order my steps in thy word, and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppressor, the oppression of man, so will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant, and teach me thy statutes. Rivers of waters run down mine eyes, because they keep not thy law. Uh, look at verse 137. Righteous are thou, O Lord, and upright are thy judgments. You say, why'd you take us to Psalm 119? The entire 119th Psalm is talking about the Word of God. The testimonies, the judgments, the statutes, the commandments, thy word, thy law. It's all referring to the word of God. Now, I, I told you that we were going to look at Psalm 119 and Isaiah. You're rather close to Isaiah being in the book of Psalms. Just flip uh, over to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. You're going to jump Proverbs, Song of Solomon. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. And I want us to look at verses 6 through 8. You can begin to um, see why I brought you here to these verses. Because we're talking about the Word of God. So Psalm, or excuse me, Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 6, this is what it reads. The voice said, cry, period. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Verse 7, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Verse 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now here at Pleasant Hill Bible Church, we have been studying biblical theology. And if you're watching this video, you can already tell that I, am a, I enjoy studying theology. And truly, uh, the Christian enjoys theology and loves theology, a right understanding of who God is. Um, ultimately, every Christian loves the Bible. Every Christian loves the Word of God. It's, it's almost a contradiction of terms to, to say that you are a Christian and you don't love the Bible. It, it, it doesn't, it, it's like oil and water. If you are a Christian, you love the Bible. And there in the Bible, we find that we learn of God. We learn how God desires us to live. Uh, we find our peace and our comfort, our life in the Word of God. And as at the onset, I said, I want to talk about hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is a big word uh, that simply means a method of interpretation, specifically a methodology that interprets the scriptures. Do you know that there is a way to wrongly interpret the Bible? In fact, it's more common uh, than not. Uh, misinterpretation is literally everywhere. And if we're not careful, we can often misinterpret the Bible. And it is a deadly and dangerous thing. To get the Bible wrong. In fact, friends, if you get the Bible wrong, it is, it is truly a sin against God. God desires that his Bible be interpreted rightly. We know, we've studied this, that the Bible is inspired. Uh, 
Well, you find this in the book of Timothy, um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, um, verse 16. Excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I think I said 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God, by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, that's through verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's not perfect as in a sinless perfectionism that Paul is talking about there. What he's actually talking about is to be a whole or a complete man, to be, to be by the word of God, made complete, um, lacking nothing, equipped or furnished to do the good works of God. Um, it was James that said, you, you show me, I will show you my faith by my works. It's not that good works save us, but that our works are proof of our saving faith. I want to share with you a quote that I've shared often. It's by R.C. Sproul, who said everyone's a theologian in one way or another. But this is the quote that R.C. Sproul says, No Christian can avoid theology. The issue then is not, do we want to have a theology? The real issue then is this, do we have a sound theology? Do we embrace true or false doctrine? It is so important, friends, that you know how to interpret the Bible rightly. Um, in this day in which we live, there are so many ways that you can actually uh, receive the Word of God. And what I mean by that is, is a lot of us are trapped within our houses, okay? Or we, we listen to the radio or we turn on the television. And it's easy to come across some very bad teaching about the Bible. So I want to look at how we know what the Bible is actually trying to tell us. And what is the right way to interpret the Bible? First, I'm going to start out by showing you some wrong ways to interpret the scriptures. Um, I want to look at three wrong ways, and then I want to show you what the right way is. So firstly, there's, there's many wrong ways to look at the Bible and try to interpret the Bible. Um, but this stems from ultimately a hermeneutic, friends. Listen, a, herme a hermeneutic, a proper biblical hermeneutic stems from convictions found in the Word of God. Uh, you must be dogmatic about this. I like what Steve Lawson says. He goes, we're not just dogmatic about this. We're bulldogmatic about this. Um, you got to know what the Bible means. And you got to stand on what the Bible means. Uh, we realize that, that not everything is easily interpreted and not everything is, is easily discernible. But the fact still remains that the Bible only means one thing. When you read specific verses in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we know that it is God-breathed, it is inspired, as we've just read in 2 Timothy 3.16. Theopneustos is the Greek word. It means God breathed God's air. He inspired the very words, verbal, plenary, uh, inspiration of the scriptures. Um, even the penman, the, the penman that wrote the very inspired words, their characteristic, their writing traits, they come out in there in the writing. We see this in the Apostle Paul and elsewhere. Um, but we realize, friends, is that we have to interpret this Bible, this, the Word of God, rightly. And uh, one of the false ways to interpret the Scriptures would be a text-based or a reader-based hermeneutic. And what I mean by that is that it's like if we pick up a, a verse off the page and we squeeze it into what we want it to mean for us. Um, oftentimes, people say to me, they say, you know, what does that verse mean to me? Or maybe in a small group setting, individuals will come together and a leader of the small group will say, well, what does that verse mean to you? Frankly, friends, it doesn't matter what that verse means to you. What that verse is intended to mean by the author is the only thing that matters. So there, I've already alluded to what the proper way is to interpret the scriptures. And the proper way to interpret the scriptures is to see what the author intended um, to find out, to dig deep into what the penman, what the author desired for those verses to mean. Ultimately, we know that God is the author of Scripture. Uh, it originated with Him. Uh, every word is inspired. We, real, we realize that it will not fail. Just like in Isaiah chapter 40, what we've just read. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God, the word of the Lord will stand forever. It is without fail. It is infallible. 
And this must base, this must be your conviction. You must believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And you're not only too called to be dogmatic about it, you're called to be bulldogmatic about it. Have you ever encountered someone that says, ah, well, you know, I know that's a difficult passage to interpret, but I don't want to be dogmatic. Um, when someone speaks that way, they are usually saying that I have a, a, a gelatin, actually, uh, view of the Scriptures. I, I have a, uh, you know, I'm not going to actually take a stand or a, I'm not going to build a conviction on what the Bible says. Um, there's some things that they will, they don't want to admit to being dogmatic about, but they're very dogmatic about it. They just don't want to come across as offensive. Because ultimately, friends, the reason we need to be convicted about the truth of Scripture is because it's totally contrary to the nature of man. If we preach anything but what the author intended the Bible to mean, we've now caved to the nature of man. We're giving man, we're tickling the ears, we're giving man what he wants to hear. Uh, the reason that the Bible is a life-giving word is because it is completely contrary to what man wants or thinks. And we love this word. Uh, Christians love the word of God. It is, it is like the food for our soul. Uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, so, so it's important for us to develop a proper hermeneutic to make sure that we are interpreting the Bible rightly. Um, I, was, I was taking a small class online this week, and Abner Chow was the professor, and he was teaching about an instance where he, was, he encountered a, one, of those, uh, one of those daily verse calendars that you place on your window seal or something, and you, place, and you turn it day by day, and you get a new verse every day. And he was, he was sharing that he, a friend had sent him a picture of one of these particular daily verse calendars. And um, it was from Luke chapter 4, verse number 7. And um, Luke chapter 4, verse 7 reads this. Now, just bear with me. I'm going to give you some more background to this. But remember, this is a daily verse calendar. And Luke chapter 4, verse 7 said, If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Seems like an innocent enough verse, and aside from the, the fact that, you know, pulled out of context, it actually gives ground to a prosperity theology. Um, but that was on the little inspirational calendar, and below the verse said Luke chapter 4, verse number 7. And if you read that and take that at face value, the company actually capitalized the letter M. And if you just read that verse, if thou therefore wilt worship me, and then that M is capitalized, you actually think that that's talking about God and that all shall be thine. The sad reality of that verse, though, friends, is when you look at the context of Luke chapter 4, that is the temptation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the wilderness. And the one speaking that verse is Satan. So we need to realize that actually if you were to take that verse and apply it to your life, it would be calling you to, to worship Satan. So it's so important that we interpret Scripture rightly. When I was a young man and I was yet unsaved, I actually would read the Bible. And I would find a, a way of opening the Bible. Whenever I encountered a poor circumstance in my life or things weren't going the way I really wanted it to go, I would set my Bible down, I would kick it open, and I would take my finger and I would touch a verse. And I'd say, oh, look, that's great, that's good. Um, and I would squeeze that verse to mean what I wanted it to mean. That's a reader-based or a text-based hermeneutic. Um, ultimately, friends, that's how cults are built. It's dangerous to, to build a hermeneutic on that method. Now, can you just read the Bible and develop what the Bible, what the God wants you to, to understand? Yes, especially. And, and the only way that this takes place is whenever you pray and ask God by His Spirit to teach you the Word of God. Um, you, can, you can derive what the author intended the Word to mean when you study the Scriptures. Remember uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses... Uh, 15 and 16, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Friends, we love the Bible, and we must be diligent to make sure we get it right. Um, and you say, well, what's the big deal? Can't I just read the Bible? Yes, you can, you can read the Bible. I encourage you to read the Bible, but I encourage you to be on guard that you're reading it rightly. Uh, find out and be driven with what did the author mean? And you say, well, look, that's going to take a lot of work. It, it will. Um, this book is meant for life. 
however many years that you're on this earth that God blesses you with, um, it is intended for you to know him. And to know him, the only way to know God is at his word. The only way to increase faith is to hear the word of God. The faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But we must be diligent to make sure that we interpret the Bible rightly. And to rightly interpret the Bible means that you have a hermeneutic that is driven by what did the author intend. Um, there are many ways to do this. One way is to just make sure that you read a verse in its context. Um, the other way, the, the, most, the most profitable way to, do, to develop a right hermeneutic is to do it often. Read the Bible often. If you're satisfied with five or ten minutes in the morning of Scripture, and you quote-unquote develop a devotion time, that's great. I don't want to dissuade you from having a devotion time. But I want to encourage you to go more. Go deeper. Get yourself a good Bible, uh, study Bible. Maybe get yourself a hold of a good commentary. Uh, find some good teaching that you will be able to, to grow in a faithful exposition of the Word of God that's going to teach you what the Bible means. Uh, and this leads me to another area where we have to be cautious of. And, and this is what I'm seeing taking place, uh, uh, taking place a lot in this moment of our history. Of history. And that is a, another false way to interpret the Bible is what is known as a community-based hermeneutic. And what I mean by that is we all have those preachers that we like. We all have those guys that we, we everything they say is gold. Uh, preachers, pastors can fall into this trap. They can fall into this community-based hermeneutic and they can develop bad habits. Um, you know, we all have, all pastors have their commentaries that they enjoy going to. They trust these guys. They trust what they say. And, and they'll, they'll, they'll spoon feed, feed everything that they say. And, and because, because they are of a particular denomination or they're of a particular background or theological standing, they'll, they'll take their word for gold. Um, that's developing a community-based hermeneutic. That's saying that, look, I'm going to believe what is said by this man because he said it. A lot of denominationalism is, is fueled by a community-based hermeneutic. Um, we have to make sure that we get back to what the author intended. The reason I warn you against a, a community-based hermeneutic is because a lot of us, every morning, we turn on the television and we find the guy that we really like to listen to and we, we digest everything he says without actually getting back to his scriptures and making sure that what he said was right. Uh, now look, guys, I don't pretend to know it all. If anything, if you really could step into my mind for five minutes, you're going to find out that I know a lot less than, than I may portray. Uh, it's only by God's grace that, that, I, that we can even open his scripture and learn of him more. Um, the best way to develop a proper hermeneutic is to beg God to teach you his word. And that's what we must do. We can't take this lightly. We can't be flippant about the Bible. We can't be flippant about what is, in, what is contained in the Bible. We can't desire only what we want to see. We want to take every verse from Genesis to Revelation as equally profitable. We can't take or leave or pick or choose what we want or what we don't want. Everything in the Word of God is something for the Christian to love. Because ultimately our lives are built upon. And lastly, I'll, I'll end here. If we fail to get the, the Bible right, if we fail to, to rightly divide the word of truth, we run the risk of pursuing a different gospel. If we fail to, to understand what God is saying in his word, we ultimately run the risk of worshiping a different Christ. If we're molding verses and squeezing verses into what we want them to mean, we are in grave danger. I can't stress this enough. We must drive at what did God mean when he wrote these words. So I pray that you're encouraged, friends. Study out the rest of Psalm 119. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be in Psalm 23 uh, for our morning Bible study. And I pray that you would be encouraged by the word of God. Dive deep. Learn of him more. 
There's no greater treasure in all the world than to know the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I love you guys. Take care. And God bless.